Uh, welcome you all to this uh, course on diffraction and imaging. Okay. In the last class, we considered parallel diffraction, some different types of uh, uh, parallel diffraction and what is the effect of dynamical scattering on parallel diffraction we considered. Okay. Then we started discussing about uh, convergent beam and diffraction also. Okay. Since I had done some introduction to convergent beam diffraction, okay. What is one advantage of a convergent beam diffraction is that uh, from whatever is the region we are trying to generate the data, it is from a very small region of the sample. When we converge the beam, essentially we get the information from an area of cross section maybe of the order of we can make it up to some 10 nanometer or 1 nanometer depending upon the type of filament which we have. If we have an FEG type of a filament, we can focus it to a very sharp point and still we have very high intensity of the beam. Okay. So that is one. So from a very small region, we get that information because if we take a parallel beam, okay, getting a crystal which is free of various types of defects is going to be extremely difficult, correct? If we choose a very small region of the sample, the probability of having okay, a region which is defect free, that is point defects will anyway be there, but at least free of dislocations and all other defects is going to be high. Okay? That is one advantage. Okay? Then I mentioned that this could be used to find out lattice parameter measurement accurately. Okay. If we can measure the lattice parameter accurately, okay, then the variation in lattice parameter is what strain is all about. So we can find out strain distribution in the sample, that information we can get it. Okay. Then I mentioned that a unicell lattice parameter, we can get that information. Then we can find out the point group and space group symmetry of the crystal. Okay. Then we can find out characteristics of the various defects also could be done. Okay. What I will do today is that try to cover briefly okay, like uh, uh, lattice strain measurement, okay, how point group and space group could be determined and then also about some recent development okay, in diffraction, whatever has come. That also I will briefly mention that. See, if you see here this pattern, how do you, as per kinematical condition, okay, all the uh, structure factors which we have derived is that kinematical diffraction is taking place, correct? Only single scattering. If that is the case, the intensity, the central spot should be very strong and all diffracted spots which are coming, coming adjacent to it, they should be really weak. But here if you look at it, almost all the spots are equally strong. Okay. This happens because of dynamical scattering or multiple scattering taking place within that sample. That is the transmitted beam uh, contributes to diffraction, okay. uh, diffracted beam as well as the diffracted beam contributing to a transmitted beam. Okay. And uh, with a parallel beam when we take a diffraction, normally we have a sample, we make a parallel beam fall onto the sample surface. When this comes out of it, some diffraction is taking place. Okay. Then these beams which are falling on the lens, okay, they are focused to a point these beams are also focused to a point. So at the back focal plane, we have the diffraction pattern, correct? And there is an image plane which is going to be there. Suppose I put an aperture here, okay, so that only this much of the area of the sample I choose it. Okay. By putting an aperture on the sample, I can or we can decide from which area we wanted diffraction to come. So the two way in which we can do it is either you can keep the aperture at the center of the optic axis and move the sample 
okay that is the best option so that all the resolution the, the uh, since the beam passes through the optic axis resolution will be very good but if you do that what is the sort of an aperture size which we can choose if you go to really small aperture sizes okay then what's going to happen is that frontal diffraction will take place that is going to mask the effect of the, that aperture itself will not be able to see whether it's uh, uh, what is the size of that aperture correct it's going to be very difficult okay how this can be avoided is in the image plane we get an image of this region which has been uh, where the beam has fallen so we get some magnified image here correct in this if i introduce an aperture here okay choose a small area okay this is equivalent to because choosing a very small aperture it's equivalent to putting a small aperture on the sample right it's a reciprocity theorem that is if i put an aperture here its magnified view will be coming here only this much region will be seeing it if i put an aperture this is equivalent to choosing only a small region on the sample that way the effect of this uh, diffraction effects could be avoided but there is a limitation on how small that aperture which we can go if we make that up because all lenses like especially objective lenses got a spherical aberration associated with it what is the effect of the spherical aberration is for a point object it doesn't form a point image we get a spread so that means that closer to the edge there can be a spread so as the aperture we make it smaller and smaller we will not be sure from which area of the sample we are getting the diffraction okay that problem will come okay when such a situation comes we can't use aperture at all to get a diffraction pattern so then what was done was that can we use a parallel beam make the beam as small as possible or you can use a small convergence so that can be converged to a very small beam this sort of diffraction was the ones which was uh, came in the late 80s this is used to be called as nano diffraction or micro diffraction okay especially when you have uh, uh, the source of electrons as uh, a field emission gun since the current is high okay even for a nano beam we can have sufficient current to get diffraction pattern okay from a such a small region this is essentially one which is taken from the literature if you see it it is from a carbon nano tube okay from different regions of it you can put a very small beam okay that is what we have we are not using any aperture beam itself has been made small only from that region the diffraction will come okay when the beam is being made very small and it falls on a small region you know that there will be a spread of spot also will take place that's what you can see that here and this is how the sort of aperture uh, uh, the sort of diffraction which we get it this is called as a nano diffraction okay and then in uh, uh, cbd okay uh, when we make the beam very small like this nano diffraction or we converge a beam to a very small area only from that region we are getting the diffraction what is the consequence of that that means that suppose you are made the beam into maybe assume uh, 10 nanometers that means that if we have a second phase particle of the size of 10 nanometer we can get make the beam focused onto that region and we can get information about the point group space group symmetry and all, all we can get it from such a small precipitate if you use x-ray diffraction okay we require at least about uh, uh, millimeter size samples which will be required if you have to go for a neutron diffraction to get single crystal we will be requiring a single crystal of the order of uh, uh, maybe about a few millimeter to a centimeter size samples will be required whereas with electron diffraction we can use samples of the order of 10 nanometers or even 1 nanometer 
because with the uh, uh, field emission gun, we can make the beam into 1 nanometer size also. So, from precipitate as small as 1 nanometer, 5 nanometer, that means that when you are working on a nanoparticle, the particle sizes are very small. For those nanoparticles, on each nanoparticle, if it is a single crystal, you can find out point group phase group symmetry of the crystals using convergent beam diffraction. Is it clear? From okay. And then another, another factor also which is important is that the whenever most of the TEM samples are wedge shaped. Okay. So, if the thickness varies continuously, if the intensity of the diffraction spot also vary from region to region. So, what we get it is that intensity of each of the spots like the spot here is going to be an average over the thickness. Okay. If we choose a very small area, the probability of thickness variation in that area is small, so that we can assume to be of a constant thickness. Okay. And have told yesterday, uh, not yesterday in the last class that how to find out the uh, thickness of the sample using convergent beam diffraction. Right? I will anyway just uh, uh, repeat it again. Okay. Uh, this I mentioned that uh, if the convergence angle is uh, very small and the spots do not overlap. Okay. Then the type, the type of spot pattern which we get it, okay. that is the type of a pattern which we get it here. Okay. In these sort of uh, patterns, okay, what is the convergence angle? The convergence angle is smaller than the Bragg angle. Okay. This also has a consequence. Okay. What is the consequence of it? If we consider like a parallel beam, okay, like the case which we consider. If the plane is diffracting is also parallel to the beam, exactly parallel, and the beam is also parallel, will we get a diffraction? We will not. Okay. But why do we get diffraction when the beams are parallel? That is because though we consider the beam externally to be parallel, still many electrons have got a trajectory which has slightly deviated from it which is responsible for a diffraction to take place. Okay. That is one. And what is the consequence of it? Is that when we satisfy a Bragg condition, we will be getting an intense one and when we move away from it, the intensity drops off drastically. Okay. Another consequence of it that, that means that for this convergence angle, exact Bragg angle diffraction cannot take place within this beam size. If I make this beam size larger, okay, so that the angle is larger than the Bragg condition, okay, then always a Bragg diffraction, a Kikuchi diffraction can also take place. That is, even though the beam is convergent. Most of them do not satisfy the Bragg ang angle, that is like uh, here. In this one, it is a parallel one. Like here, if you consider here, the angle 2 alpha of the convergence beam is larger than theta b. Okay. Theta b is the Bragg angle. So, if it is larger than Bragg angle, even when the beam is falling onto it, for that particular plane, most of the beam do not satisfy the Bragg condition, they are inclined, but there is one particular direction that is from here to here, the beam which is falling in this direction oriented like this, okay, they all will satis they satisfy exact Bragg condition. Okay. So, when they satisfy exact Bragg condition, this will give rise to excess and deficient lines can come. Deficient line in a central spot and excess line in diffracted spot. Okay. That is what we have seen in the last class, correct? That is here there is a deficient line 
there is an exact line and you do not see any other contrast here because of the simple reason that the thickness of the file here is less than psi g. Psi g is the extinction distance which I had introduced in the last class what the psi g means. Okay. If the extinction distance, uh, if the thickness of the file is larger than psi g, okay, then some uh, uh, fluctuations in amplitude can happen. Okay, that will give rise to a fringe contrast. Okay. Using this fringe contrast, okay, measuring the separation between the fringes, and using this condition for the intensity equal sin squared pi T s by this factor, so the T into S effective, if it becomes n, the intensity will start fluctuating, right. If it becomes n by 2, uh, if it is become uh, uh, pi by 2 this factor, then it will become intensity minus. So, there will be an alternate bright and dark fringes will come, okay. So, that is what essentially is uh, S effective is nothing but root of S squared plus 1 by psi. So, this we will come later in the next week, we will talk about it. So, then we will be able to write an expression like this, okay. With this sort of an expression, okay, we can uh, draw a straight line, okay, connecting these two terms and the intercept is going to be the uh, 1 by t squared, the slope from which we can find out from the region the beam has fallen, the thickness of the file, okay. And this is occurring because we have considered here only a two beam condition that is means that only one plane is satisfying the Bragg condition. If only one plane is satisfying the Bragg condition, what will be the effect on the diffractions part? How will the diffractions uh, pattern look like if only one plane is responsible for it? Only one or more? No, it will be more but it will be uh, will be all on? That is, it, this is the central part. This will be g minus g. That is, a longer row reflections can come because if g can come, first order, second order, third order reflections also can come from the same plane, correct? So, only one row of spots will come. So, in that case we will be getting only fringes like this. Suppose the orientation of the beam is such that it is along a zone axis, then many more spots are simultaneously getting uh, excited, okay. That means that many more planes are satisfying Bragg condition. So, we can assume to be each one of them is giving rise to a fringe pattern like this. What will be the net effect of it? will be getting a variation in contrast within the uh, central spot in this, okay. When do we get a line? Which one? When do we get the single line? The single line you get it when it is only a two beam condition. That means only one plane is responsible for Bragg diffraction. When you have the beam direction is such that like for example, uh, in a simple cubic structure, if the beam is along 0, 0, 1, you can have 1, 0, 0 plane, 0, 1, 0 plane, 1, 1, 0 plane, 1, 1 bar 0 plane, all of them can give rise to diffraction, correct? So, in such a case, you will be getting a sort of a, this sort of a fringe which will be like this, which will be essentially displaying that symmetry of that zone axis. Is it clear? So, the relation with the thickness or Yeah, the relation with the thickness, if it exactly satisfies the Bragg condition, then there should be a dark line here at the center of this disk and the bright line should come here, correct? That is where the central spot is. Then S effective into T should be there as the beam is a conical beam, other beams, okay, it is away from the Bragg condition. 
So, since it is a way there is a variation in S is continuously varying okay. The S effective into T for whatever be the value of becomes integers there will be a dark fringes will come in between white fringe will come. So, that depending upon what the separation is going to be there and on the lattice parameter of the material all this you will be getting a set of fringes which will be coming. So, that is what is responsible for it. See the whole contrast in microscopy when we talk about it is all interference contrast or you can see is a phase contrast, phase contrast is nothing but an interference effect okay. Then I mentioned that if we take a axis pattern okay, if a beam is a parallel beam okay and it is falling on the sample in one particular direction like in this case okay and if we make the uh, camera constant very small then in the size of the screen which we have chosen we can see not only the uh, zero order lave zone the higher order lave zone some spots will also be seen okay what will be the distance from here to here okay this we can measure it on the screen fill in and if we measure this and the radius of the evolved sphere is 1 by k okay and this distance is h okay and so using this relationship we can find out what is going to be the value of h. So, but, uh, the, sir, we will not cut like the point exactly right, Which the point? exact you will not know the exact position. See, Essentially, when you reduce it and many orders are coming, okay. Essentially, like here, if you see it, that which is the one which you take it to be the uh, central, that is the one which exactly satisfies all the points satisfying the bracket condition, exact bracket condition, okay. So, you can't tell which one will exactly satisfy. So, some of them will be the half. When they well, are some of them are half, okay, only for one particular one it is going to satisfy with respect to a center and exact circle, okay. There will be some error will be there associated with it, but the distance which is being measured is large, okay. So, essentially what you can do it is with this we will be able to find out what is going to be the H, okay. This H how we can relate it, okay, depending upon the type of crystal which we have whether it is a primitive or body centered okay or a face centered okay this 1 by h could be returned as uvw okay this is in terms of direction also we can write it with respect to a crystal structure the magnitude of the vector okay. if you do that then this will turn out to be a factor p which we can write it this factor will be depending upon simple cubic this p will be 1 BCC this P will be 1 for UVW this you can work it out because you know the structure factor consideration and the same basis it comes for the vectors okay. Then 2 for UVW all odd similarly for FCC also this factors will be there okay. This way we can one can find out what this, UVW will be zone axis, right? this OVW is the uh, vector in the real lattice UVW that is the zone axis direction zone axis. correct. Okay. Then it showed also that when you have the reciprocal lattice, so when you have constructed it for uh, different zone axis condition like H u plus K v plus L w equals plus minus n, okay. n can be 0, then it is the uh, 0 order lave zone, n can be equal to 1 okay 2 like that then we can generate different reciprocal lattice section. This is what it is being shown for FCC for uh, uh, 001, 011 and I think uh, 111 type of zones. For the uh, zero order zone as well as for the first order zone okay. This same thing which I had shown it here I had just shown the reciprocal lattice section okay. So, if you consider with respect to when the evolved sphere goes, evolved sphere will cut here and evolved sphere if it cuts 111, okay. 
from that you can make out that which is going to be the one which satisfies this condition. Then one can generate patterns like this and for a face centered this is how the pattern should look like. Okay. But these central spots like one on one type of a spot which satisfies this condition H u plus k v plus L w equals uh, 1 will not be visible on the central spot. That is actually coming as the first order Lavey zone, a few spots which you get it. But if we try to extrapolate it and complete that full uh, reciprocal lattice plane, then we will be finding that this is where they will be uh, come uh, sitting on top of the reciprocal lattice point. That is what it has been drawn. Okay, it is a simulated pattern. Is this clear? Whereas for a primitive lattice, all the spots will be for this particular zone axis direction it will be one will be coming on top of the other. Okay. That is exactly what is being shown here is if it is a primitive lattice, this is how the 0 order Lavey zone and the first order Lavey zone looks like. And this if we try to, uh, we know this distance then we can generate this lattice and when it merges this is how it will look like overall when we simulate it. If it is for a A centered, this if we try to uh, extend it and uh, superimpose it, this is how it will look like. For a B centered, this is how in this direction it will be summed. If it is uh, body centered, this is how it will look like. Okay. This sort of patterns you have to generate it. That is all these things since you know all the structure factor rules and the reciprocal lattice can be constructed, we can generate this sort of patterns so that we are familiar with it and when you do a microscopy, you can immediately you know that uh, the, if it appears like this, you know this is the crystal structure with you are dealing with, then immediately you can make out to which zone it corresponds to. Okay. Then another is for the lattice parameter determination if you are looking for okay, or strain measurement both. I mentioned that there is excess and efficient lines will be there, correct? The convergence angle is very small, okay? Due to elastic scattering of the convergent beam, we need not get a deficient line at the center because that beam is not in a condition to satisfy the Bragg condition because the convergence angle is not. Whereas, in a conventional sample, even when we have parallel beam, we do get a Kikuchi diffraction pattern, correct? What is the reason for the Kikuchi pattern to take place when even though the beam is parallel, okay, for some electrons as it entering into it, some point in the sample, inelastic scattering is taking place, uh, incoherent scattering is taking place, incoherent okay, and inelastic and because of that, that beam gets di becomes a divergent beam. That is what is responsible for the Kikuchi line. So, if we consider an elastic scattering within the converged beam, unless the angle of convergence of the sample is made very large, that is suppose the planes are like this and if this is what the angle theta b has to be, okay. if I make the convergent beam of the angle to alpha larger than this, Definitely for this orientation of the okay, elastic diffraction is going to take place in one region which satisfies exact Bragg condition. The other regions there will be a uniform intensity because from this region the beam has been that is from this plane the beam uh, has been diffracted. Okay, so, intensity of the transmitted beam has come down. Okay, that will give rise to yeah, uh, a deficient line, correct? Though this is similar to, and this line will be seen only within this spot because the center, this one, if you look at it, this is like a cone, okay, in which it is happening. This is the beam. So, in this particular beam, if you look at it, okay. The Bragg condition is being satisfied only for 
this particular area of it, correct? So, only within this uh, the diffraction spot which we get it, okay. Within the uh, uh, undiffracted spot or the central beam, only we will be getting this deficient line and corresponding to that an excess line will come in the should come in the uh, uh, diffracted spot or the diffracted beam. Okay. Suppose the convergent angle is smaller than that of the theta b, then what can happen? That is what the case in when the diffraction spots are not merging. Okay, each spot is that each diffracted that is convergent beam the patterns are like this. If you get spots like this, when the spots do not merge because from here to here with respect to a sample if we see, take it this is 2 theta correct. So, what is the convergence angle of the beam is going to be only this much 2 alpha. So, this is always smaller than the Bragg angle. If that is the case for the uh, uh, 0 third or Lave zone mostly we will not get deficient lines within the direct beam. But what does uh, this H u plus K v plus equals 1 means? For this case the planes are in the sample the planes are very much inclined with respect to the beam direction right. For those planes this convergent beam could satisfy it can still be falling within the bra condition okay. Because of that only for higher order uh, reflections you will be getting Kikuchi type of a pattern are called as uh, uh, deficient higher order lave zone spots in the central spot and the excess lines will come in first order lave zones only first order or second order those higher order lave zones. Is this clear? Okay. Outside of this uh, this we will come to I will just show you that and this bright excess lines and they are called as the holes this and dark deficient lines are the ones which we see within this this okay. Then another thing also which you know that uh, delta theta by theta is going to be equal to delta A by A. The larger the Bragg angle okay, that suppose a sample is there some strain is there the large parameter and delta A is the strain, delta A by A is the strain okay. For the same strain larger the theta value which you choose delta theta is going to be large that means that the separation between the lines which you are going to see is going to increase okay. What does it mean? Delta A by A is equal to a minus a 0 by a 0 you write. This will be like delta theta by this is a strain. Na? So, corresponding to a as well as a 0 you should be getting two lines. Okay. That means that delta theta by theta will also be equal to theta 1 minus theta 2 by you write theta 1. Okay. The larger the theta value this delta theta 1 minus theta 2 is going to be large because uh, what is the formula you write it? 2 d sin theta when theta is small 2 d theta equals lambda. Na. You differentiate it you will be getting this expression. Okay. So, for larger Bragg angle okay, or higher order Lave zones if you use it they correspond to from larger theta Bragg theta values. 
So, then we are going to get this expression. Okay. So, you look at the central spot, there are lots of lines are there. Okay. These deficient lines are corresponding to some uh, elastic diffraction is taking place. So, this is like a Kukuchi type of a diffraction which is occurring because the beam is a, uh, a convergent beam okay. for some particular direction that satisfies the exact back condition others do not. And to find out the lattice parameters from this, okay. since we know the value of the camera constant, okay, if you know the lattice parameter of the sample, okay, uh, yeah, camera constant and the distances can be measured. So, we can simulate that pattern and try to match it. Okay. Some computer simulation will be required to exactly match this different. Okay. That is essentially what is being shown in the next slide. You see this. This is a computer simulated uh, diffraction pattern where within this circle is what you see all these lines. And these are all the ones where the excess uh, Kikuchi lines will be, bright lines. Uh, bright lines will be appearing. Okay. With this, one can try to find out the lattice parameter very accurately. And another also, as the Bragg angle becomes large, okay, the uh, way the intensity falls off sharply on either side from the Bragg condition is also sharp. Because of that, the line, these lines also become very sharp. So, the sharper the, the efficient lines, okay, you can measure their separation measure their distances very accurately. Here, I am just showing an example where in the central spot, okay, you have deficient lines are there. It is in the sample in the unstrained condition. Okay. The sample is being strained. Okay. Now, you have these lines of all are split. Okay. The separation between these lines, if you can measure, and when you know the lattice parameter, this has to be all done using a simulation. Okay. Then you can find out the strains very accurately. Okay. This can so happen that you have a sample. In some region, a composition is changing. If the composition changes from region to region, the lattice parameters also will change. That means that from one region to another region, there is a strain which is introduced in the sample. Correct? Then suppose it is a precipitate which is there like gamma prime precipitates which forms in nickel base superalloys. They have very large size of the order of micron size. Okay. So, those precipitates are essentially in this region. Then I can put a beam on different parts of the because since I can make the beam into few nanometers, I can make the beam fall everywhere and find out what is going to be the strain which can be measured. So, the strain mapping could be done at different regions of the precipitate. This has been done routinely by uh, uh, researchers. Okay. So, okay. Point group and space group symmetry, okay. this is clear. This way we can find out by matching this and finding out the separation between these Kikuchi lines with respect to the spot, we can measure the lattice parameter as well as the strain. Point group and space group determination, I will not go into the detail because it is uh, uh, it's a tough thing, one has to understand quite a bit. But what I wanted to tell is that this requires lot of uh, patterns which one has to take in. The patterns essentially which are required are called sort of high symmetry patterns and then plus g minus g condition also, we have to take some patterns. Okay, uh, And these are called some different types of projection. There is, There are some terminologies which are being used in this analysis. One is called the projection diffraction group. Projection diffraction group means that if we take a two-dimensional diffraction group, how many two-dimensional diffraction group which we have? That is 5 Bravais lattices, correct? And 10 point groups are there, plane groups are there. Okay. That is all which we can get it here. So, in the diffraction pattern also we will get it that will exhibit that. Then another is that each of the disc can contain some intensity variations which will exhibit 
particular type of symmetry is associated with it. Okay. This is like if you remember, if you look at the stereographic projection of the different point groups, each is typical of the point groups associated with it, right? Like if a mirror, you know that how a mirror should appear, right? That is if I take a, suppose this is the mirror plane, okay? Any point which is there, yeah, correspondingly there will be an another, this is how it will appear. So in the disk also, each of this disk which we are seeing it, the diffraction disk also exhibit this sort of symmetries. Okay, that is the only thing which I can tell you. But what is the origin of it, how it comes, that is beyond the scope. Okay. So then we look at the bright field disk, that is bright field disk means that the undiffracted one. Okay. What sort of symmetries which it exhibits? Then plus minus g, you tilt it and look at the symmetry, all with the convergent beam only. Okay. If we do that, then we will be able to find out various point group symmetries. Okay. That requires a lot of things which I am not. But what I will just show you is that from this you generate what is called as a diffraction group. Okay. All these things are beyond that class. Okay. Example, you see that this is the whole pattern which is called as that is central spot and nearest neighbor spots are being shown. It exhibits some symmetry. Okay. The bright field pattern means that only the central spot, what sort of symmetry which it exhibits, this is what it is called as the bright field spot. Okay. You look here, this is plus g. The same thing is tilted so that this part becomes instead of the central spot, one of the diffraction spots that becomes stronger. If you look here, you see two sort of dots come in the picture. And with respect to this, if you try to see it, okay, it exhibits a symmetry. With respect to this, if you try to see it, there is a mirror symmetry is there. Similarly, here if you see it, like this various symmetries can be seen. This sort of patterns have to be taken on various zone axis and you look at the type of symmetries which they exhibit. This is used to find out the point group symmetries very uh, correctly. Okay. These patterns are all coming out of convergent beam diffraction only. What you have shown is that this is a symmetric pattern. This is from uh, alpha titanium. Okay. But if I tilt the beam in such a way that the central spot moves, uh, uh, this part becomes very strong, okay. the central part is shifted, then this is the sort of a pattern. Now, they ex now you look at within each of the spots, symmetry has changed. You understand that some uh, variation in contrast which comes, that exhibits point group symmetry. Okay. These are used to find out the overall point group symmetry. That is all which uh, you have to remember. Okay. This is essentially some of these things which has been theoretically done, how it will look like, okay. which I do not want to go into the details of it. But these are used as a comparison to compare with the other one to find out. That is why I said that is a very involved work. But this is a very interesting and exciting one. And this is how do we find out a space group. Okay. Space group can be determined very easily okay. using a kinematical condition. Suppose you assume that somehow multiple diffraction does not occur. The file is extremely thin. Then the central beam will go, only single scattering is taking place. You will be getting some diffraction pattern what will be the intensity of that each of the diffraction spots? It is decided by H u plus k v plus L w, correct? This is done over all the h, u, v and w for a particular, okay, this is, this structure factor is essentially for f of g, I should put it, right, for particular g value. Like that you can calculate it for different g values. One can calculate 
the structure factor. Square of structure factor gives intensity, assuming thickness is small. Otherwise, you multiply, you take the shape factor also. You will be able to find out intensity accurately. And since we are taking the position of each of the atom in the lattice, not the lattice, in the unit cell, the intensity now corresponds to what positions the atom is having it, right? If you are able to match these intensities, we can go back and tell that these are all the positions atom should have occupied, okay? And in the earlier class, I have told that the structure factor conditions are not only there for the Bravais lattice, for uh, glide as well as the screw axis, you have some structure factor considerations are there, correct? If you take all these things into consideration, okay, this is a conventional normal diffraction pattern, okay. And even under convergent beam conditions, okay, some kinematical condition is being satisfied where some, uh, you can uh, say the line of no contrast comes in these ones, okay. This line of no contrast is called as the GM lines, okay. The origin of it, you do not have to bother about it. But like here, if you see, the, this is some analysis which has been done for a pattern. It is an orthorhombic structure. If you look at it, there is a one mirror which is going to, one glide here and there is a glide which is perpendicular to it. These are all the two glides which are being shown. Then one should be getting a cross within this particular one. This is what the theory says and this is the simulated pattern. You look at the experimental pattern, this is what you get it then it alternates for others, okay. That is why I said that this is an involved, this sort of looking at the type of extinction uh, lines which appear in these parts and the symmetry associated with it, we can find out point group and space group symmetry. Before that, I will tell you that some of this part, if the sample is really thick, then what happens is that a lot of inelastic scattering will be taking place, incoherent inelastic scattering. That will give rise to a uniform background on the convergent beam diffraction pattern, okay. If we use an energy filtered uh, EFTM, energy filtered transmission electron microscope, then we can filter all the inelastically scattered electrons out of the way and make the diffraction pattern similarly image also with only the elastically scattered electrons, then we can get much better contrast. This is the same one where inelastic scattering has been removed. So, when the, when the dark fringes go missing? We should know nothing will be missing because the inelastically scattered electrons are coming from as the sample beam passes through the sam uh, sample, the electrons are scattered for various reasons other than diffraction. So, there is an intensity reduction. They give rise to a uniform background, this one. That those electrons are being removed. And now, we form an image or a diffraction pattern only with elastically scattered electrons. Then the image will be very sharp. That is precisely, you can see these two difference, difference between these two patterns. The same pattern without energy filtering, this is with energy filtering, okay. And many patterns, if you have to analyze it completely, we have to do a computer simulation also. This simulation has been done, I think taking some 30 directions for the beams, for the convergence angle. Then you can see that there is a good one-to-one -one matching between the experimentally observed and the theoretically determined convergent beam pattern, okay. Then another one is called a large angle. This I will just skip it. This is something which is very interesting. Okay. What is being done is that normally there is a convergent beam is there, we are getting a diffraction pattern, correct? Suppose I keep the beam in this direction, slightly tilt the sample. If I rotate the sample, process it around the particular angle, just rotate it, then what will happen? It will rotate and then many effects of diffraction gets averaged out. That is what you have to remember is that then all the disks now have vanished. They have all averaged out and the intensity of some reflections go up high and now you see that only the excess lines are seen, nothing else. I think this is the first time this uh, precision was done. 
and this is called as a hollow cone. This same thing can be done by keeping the sample and I have a cone of a beam, the cone can be also rotated. Na? See, this is exactly similar to the spinning top. When you put it, what it happens? It rotates around it. Na? It spins around it, but at the same time it goes around an axis, around it makes a constant angle and rotates. Na? That exactly what is being done in precession. Okay. This is normally a parallel beam selected area diffraction if I take it. If it is a two beam condition, I have one central spot and a bright field reflection is seen here, correct? Uh, central spot and the diffraction spot is there. These two beam dynamical scattering, that is why both the spots are very strong. If it is a kinematical condition, this part is strong, this part becomes weak. How we can do it is if I tilt the sample a little bit, go away from it, still there may be some scattering which will take place, but dynamical scattering effect will get reduced. So, you can see that identical, but the intensity has become very weak. This condition you call it as a kinematical. If it is a multi beam, you get spots like this. And if it is a zone axis, this is how the spots you get it, but you see all the spots are equally strong. Okay. This is a dynamical scattering. Okay. In a precision electron diffraction, what is being done is that I make a small focus beam and the beam I make it fall on the that is the focus beam is made to fall on this. This is the optic axis. Okay. And this beam, I rotate it around this over an angle theta. If I rotate it, what it will happen? This same beam should rotate in the diffraction plane, in the back focal plane also, it should rotate like this, na, direct beam. Okay? That is what it will normally happen. If I give an another one to make it unprocessed uh, again, then what will happen is that all these things will be again brought back to one point again. The precession beam can be brought back. That is exactly what is being done in precession electron diffraction. Sir, how do you bring back? Which one? Again to a point. This is again, again that beam has to be tilted by applying some uh, uh, voltages to coils you do it in the microscope. This all by uh, applying some uh, voltages, you can tilt the beam because electron beam is there. Either by applying a voltage or by applying a magnetic field, you can tilt it. That is essentially what is being done. Okay. Nowadays, this attachment is available as a separate attachment which one can retrofit it onto the microscope system. What is important is that without precession, when a diffraction of a silicon is taken, you see this. This is how the pattern appears. Okay. And these reflections are 0, 0, 2 should not appear by structure factor consideration, it should be absent for silicon, but it is present in the this diffraction pattern. When a precession diffraction has been done, okay, then you see this, these reflections have vanished. Okay. What essentially is being done is that over a region we are trying to collect for the all the various angles we are collecting it when process it and add all of them together. It is essentially from each orientation whatever is the beam which is coming, the sum total is what we see it in the each of that spot. Now you see that these parts have completely gone. Now this pattern looks like a what we expect for silicon satisfying kinematical condition. You understand that? So from this we can tell this is what essentially. Sir, why the spots have gone? I am not clear. Can you please explain that again? Which one? The like uh, those reflections which are should not be there were there initially. Yeah. But in, it is uh, as good as. Uh, what is essentially condition. happening is yeah. that when we do a procession, some of the reflections over all the various angles, not only from Bragg and away from it, all of them are getting added together in some point. Some of the reflections when they add together average over many points weak reflections, they become so weak compared to this one 
that they are just not same intensity is changed. Now, if you look at the intensity between these two, it appears to be this looks like what we expect for a kinematical condition. So, the dynamic okay. scattering yeah. points only come at certain angles. The dynamic scattering point comes at certain angles, but between the reflections, different reflections, if you look at the intensity ratios, there are some calculations all has been done and that shows that that ratio remains the same as what you expect in kinematical condition. That is the whole beauty of it, the precision. Okay. And not only that, this is an unprocessed one. When you process it, since you are rotating, many more reflections come into the, the diffraction spot also than what you expect. And the, what will be the consequence of it? The precession is that in uh, convergent beam diffraction, you got only the first order ring where one or two spots were there. Now, you see that the ring has spread out. Lots of spots could be seen in the diffractions pattern. And that is very clear here. You see this, this is the ring. When a precession has been done, you see that instead of this ring, there is a, it has become like a band, correct? And now more reflections could be seen compared to this one. So, analysis becomes much better with this sort of a pattern compared to doing it with uh, and this is one classic example where you can see that this is for this sample. This is being done by the people who had uh, invented this technique. This technique was invented in 19, in late 90s. Okay. They did it for convergent beam. Now, it is being used for all parallel as well convergent. This is the zone axis pattern for this crystal, okay, 0, 0, 001 zone axis. When a precession of 20 millirad is being used, the beam is being processed 20 millirad. This is how the pattern looks like. When it is 47 millirad, this is how it looks like. And this is the one which is calculated for kinematical condition. Without any precision, kinematical theory you apply, you know the thickness of the file, how the spot reflection should appear. Now, you can see that there is a good match between these two, correct? So, the precession diffraction is able to give a lot of information about the symmetry of the crystals. In fact, nowadays it is being routinely done using this to find out point group and space group symmetry of crystal structures. There are softwares which are available which people are using it. Okay. Here like this, this is for as we vary the angle of the tilt that is the precession angle if you vary, you can see that how gradually the 6 volt symmetry comes and if you, you can do the calculations to find out how the intensity of the reflections will be. Okay. So, one can do a matching between a kinematically calculated intensity of diffraction pattern okay. in the precession electron diffraction, the intensity of the spots matches with that. No, these are all separate. The precision is like a hollow cone. If I take a beam, I do it like this and take a diffraction pattern with respect to an optic axis. 20 millirad means that I have done it very small angle. Okay. That is like this. If I have a sample like this, I can take one like this. This is some angle. Okay, 20 millirad you take it. In another, this is the one over which it is being rotated. These are two different patterns taken with two different precision. Okay. As you increase the precision angle, you find that the kinematical effect becomes much stronger. And this is from a silicon carbide hexagonal one, one can see. And what is the consequence of this happened is that with the precision like conventional diffraction pattern when we take it in a stationary beam, if it is half zone axis, you get very few spots. Even of half zone axis, if I do a little bit precession, as you had seen, more spots could be done. If more spots you get it on a diffraction pattern, your analysis and the confidence limit of analyzing the diffraction pattern is better. Okay. That is what is being employed in what is called as an orientation imaging. This is essentially like in SEM, the way we do it. At different points on a grain, you just take 
orientation map, uh, the diffraction, take precision diffraction. Then if you know the crystal structure, you can have a library of different orientation how the diffraction spot should appear on the screen and you do a matching. This is also some software driven and then on that basis you can tell that how uh, different uh, uh, regions, what is the misorientation. Then you can plot misorientation map and generate uh, like what you get into the EBSD, exactly the same thing can be done. Okay. That means that uh, for nano size particles or nano grain particle deformed grains, you can find out micro texture and all which was not possible in TEM, now it is possible. Okay. I will stop here.